Uh, first off, a few housekeeping things about Forum. Thanks for everyone who played last week at Performance Forum. That was a blast. We really enjoyed ourselves. That's right. Um, and, if you, and if you're on Twitter, be sure to check out Get Informed. Uh, that's our handle. We blast out all sorts of stuff there. And thanks for everyone who came out earlier today. Uh, from 3 to 4, we were able to get a little Q&A in the boardroom um, with, with Jeff. And if that's something you like, we're going to try and do that more often, a little more intimate Q&A. Um, keep your emails handy, because that's where uh, you'll get the information. And if anyone liked these announcements, uh, I encourage you to submit them to uh, Get Informed at Gmail. And we can blast them up on the, on the blackboard so you guys can get even more spam from me. It'll be great. Um, that said, we're not here to talk about forum. We're here to have a forum. And the gentleman, we have to, <laughs> the gentleman we have today is like a music industry octopus. He's had experience in uh, venue consultation, tour production, venue management, uh, marketing, strategic planning, all throughout the board. And uh, we're going to get in here and pick his brain. I encourage you guys to think of some questions. We'll maybe have an extended Q&A. Uh, I know some of us have some stuff familiar today. Um, that said, let's get right into it. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Appergan. Thank you so much. So uh, as the ever articulate Billy said, you started uh, working in your high school and college uh, UPB, the University Programming Board. Um, let's go, let's trace from there to uh, about where you do now. What was, what was your experience? Uh, you know, I was always interested in live music, and uh, on a college campus, I found an opportunity to, um, you know, produce events on campus and, and start to get just experience and start to get an idea that that's really what I enjoy doing, what I like doing. And um, I was a business major uh, with uh, an emphasis in marketing. And you know we didn't have a music business program like you guys have. We had a program committee. I mean, th this what you guys have is is fantastic. It's a huge opportunity for you to be able to be exposed to uh, to people in the industry and just to to learn about the business side of of the music business. But uh, I started to get an idea that I really didn't want to work for Xerox. I really didn't want to work for you know Pillsbury or any of the other companies I was interviewing for at the time. So uh, I kind of had in my head that I wanted to be an agent, a booking agent. And I had someone that I had met along the way that was going to introduce me to an agent at William Morris and, and hopefully get me involved in, the, uh, in their agent training program. And I, I you know, moved to Los Angeles, and I, I tried getting a job at William Morris. And I had interviews there. And I actually had several interviews for a job in the mailroom. I never ended up getting a job there. And um, just through chance, I ended up getting a job, a part-time job, at, at a company called Concerts West. Uh, which was a, a large concert promotion company. I, I ended up getting a part-time job in their accounting department and just kind of sequestered myself there and kind of flew low, stayed beneath the radar, learned as much as I could until eventually I you know, made some friends there and made it known that uh, you know, I'd really, really be interested in an opportunity if, if one came up, and fortunately something did. Um, thankfully, this was a large company that not only managed artists but also uh, also uh, produce concert events. So a lot of the artists that they were managing uh, were, you know, they, they were managing the careers of these artists, but they were actually producing all of their concerts. So um, John Denver was an artist that they managed, for example, and if John went on tour and did 60 shows, they would not only manage the artists, but they actually go out and promote all 60 shows. So I was on that concert end of the spectrum, and I, I did that for three years, and in that time did a number of, you know, major tours with, with a lot of their clients. So uh, what is it that this experience led to. Now you have your own company that does uh, various facets of this industry. What are, what are some of the angles you do? What are some of the things you got your hand in specifically? Well, one of the niches that we kind of developed, or that I kind of developed, is I, I sort of became a business person in a creative environment. So um, you know, over the course of these years, we developed relationships with, with artists and managers and agents. And you know, today, we produce shows. We, we, we buy talent. We promote shows. We produce shows. From time to time, we're involved in a in a in an actual complete tour, uh, and we'll you know we'll be involved in all aspects of that. Um, so largely, I mean that's that's what my business is today is that we produce events. We we produce events typically for other people. So sometimes we're working for an artist specifically. Sometimes we're working for uh, a corporation if we're producing a private corporate event. Um, Kind of all over the place, uh, and then there's the the venue consulting aspect of what we do too. 
what are what are some of the sizes of venues you work with? I mean, are you hitting the are you hitting just the larger arenas? Are you hitting small? And if so, um, what sort of work are you doing for them? Uh, theaters on up to NFL stadiums. Wow. So for the NFL stadiums, we have we have nine stadiums that we work with. Uh, the NFL guys. You know, there's a, there's a very small number of stadium size artists in any given year. And, and this, this year, you know, as tough as the concert business is, it's, it's actually turning out to be kind of a robust year for, for stadium shows. You've got the U2 concerts that are rescheduled from last year. Bono had back problems. Those got postponed to this year. So you've got those dates playing off. And they actually added some markets that they, did, that they didn't have before. Um, you've got Kenny Chesney doing about a dozen or so stadium shows. Um, Taylor Swift is doing six or seven stadium shows. Uh, even Brad Paisley is doing a few stadium shows, and there's there's still a couple conversations rambling around about maybe one other possible stadium act that could be going out. So for those stadiums, we're involved in helping them negotiate deals and making sure that, uh, that they're evaluating the risk. So it really is the business kind of end of the spectrum. So that you know the, the risk in doing a show in a stadium is incredible. I mean you're. From a financial standpoint, you're, you're actually breaking even when you get to about 32, 35,000 seats. Wow. So it's very easy to be wrong, and it's very easy to be wrong in a way that you could drop you know, a million and a half dollars. They don't want to do that. So right, right, right. we want to make sure that we're trying to steer in the right direction. Um, we do a lot of work with arenas, and we do work all the way down to theaters. So um, with theaters, we're buying talent for them. With arenas, we're trying to just help them get content. And sometimes that means actually booking shows for them where they act as the promoter uh, in other instances, it's, it's negotiating with agents and promoters to try and bring shows to their arenas. So uh, let's sort of walk through one experience. Let's say Neil Diamond's going to start a tour. He's got a CD coming out, and, uh, and that's one of your close clients. Uh, so what's, what's the process like? Where do we start? I mean, a Neil Diamond tour, uh, and not every tour has been like this, but a, a well-thought-out Neil Diamond tour would would revolve around the release of an album. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned this in an earlier conversation with the smaller group that, you know, Neil Diamond's an artist that, you know, when he's done touring, he goes away. You don't see him. He's not a guy that tours every year. He goes away. So when there's a new album, there's a reason to kind of bring him back and bring him back into the limelight. So, uh, you know, with Neil, with his management, you know, it's really kind of plotting out a strategy and figuring out what the year is going to look like. So, um, Assuming that he's been gone for three years, assuming that there's a new album, for example, uh, you know, he would do a lot of media to help launch the album. Would probably include, you know, an appearance on the Today Show, the Tonight Show, Ellen, maybe Conan O'Brien, a couple of those kinds of things. And that would really be the launch of the tour. And that, that would be the media campaign where we would place all of our advertising and marketing and we'd go on sale immediately after that. Because for that week, all those eyes are on Neil Diamond. We want to take advantage of that. So we'll put the cities on sale. Um, we'll route the tour in such a way that we'll be playing as many of the major cities as we can early in the album cycle. Um, you know, we want to be in New York. We want to be in all the major cities early in the album cycle. The other reason we do that from a routing standpoint is, um, again, depending on where we're doing this in the year, if you have an artist that's going to play arenas and you have the ability to do more than one day in an arena, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to do that when you're playing the arenas in the summer months because when you get into the hockey season, the NBA season, and if you're trying to route your tour through arenas that have NBA and hockey, right. uh, particularly during playoff season when they're holding all these dates, you don't really know if they'll ever end up even using them. It's just, it's a lot easier to play those dates off in the summer. So um, the last tour, for example, we played Madison Square Gardens for four nights. We could never have gotten four nights any other time of the year. Um, so that's, that's kind of how the, that particular tour rolls out. So we play all the majors early in the album cycle. And, you know, every artist has different touring parameters. So, you know, Neil Diamond's an older artist. He doesn't want to be doing five shows a week. He doesn't need to be doing five shows a week. So we route the tour in a way that it's, it's a little more manageable for him. Um, other artists, I remember years ago doing tours with John Denver where we'd do 14 shows in 16 days. We'd just kill ourselves. We'd go out there. And, and, and the great thing about those tours is we would, we'd fly back to the, we would, we would base out of a hotel in Detroit, for example. We'd be there for a week. We'd do two shows in Detroit. We'd go, we'd go do shows in Chicago. We'd fly back to the hotel in Detroit every night. So it was, it was, a, it was a very comfortable, great way of, even though we were doing lots of shows, it was a very easy way to do it. But every tour kind of routes differently. It just depends on what the band wants to do and what they want to accomplish and the market they want to play. Right. Now, you said that there are, there's a lot of arenas now. There's a lot of these 
these first tier venues, but there's, they're having trouble, they're vying for content. Um, what are some of the trends that some of these venues are involved with uh, that are separating them from the rest of the pack? And that's what you do with venue consulting. Right, that's part of what we do is, you know, we try to, you know, th there's a lot of venues competing for shows. There's, there's more venues than there are acts that can fill them. So, uh, and there are a lot of venues that kind of neighbor one another. So an act plays through a certain part of the country, they're only gonna play one of these venues, if at all. Um, you know, years ago, the acts, I mean, if you look in, in like the 80s, when, when bands like, all the hair bands, the Judas Priest, the, the, uh, the Iron Maidens, all those kinds of bands, those guys, they'd tour America for like 18 months. They, they would play every corner of the country. They'd play every town, you know, and they would do it spread over, I mean, now you couldn't find an act that would work that much. I mean, there aren't, there aren't as many places that the acts can go. So, um, you know, a big act might just look, for example, at just playing the top 40 markets. Um, which means they're going to skip over a lot of places. Uh, I'm sorry, just uh, for those who don't know, what are the top 40 markets? Is that I mean the top 40 DMAs? It's this Chicago. I mean, take a look at the top, you know, the top population, and um, that will get you past Columbus, Ohio. It'll, it's before you get to the Tulsas, maybe. <laughs> uh, you just you'll have to look, take a look at the the market size, the market population. Right. Um, the country acts will work a lot more. There's a lot more places to go, but. Um, I don't know, I don't remember what the question was. I, I, our, our job is to, to try and find competitive advantages for our venues, you know, trying to find compelling reasons for the acts to play our buildings. And, you know, there are acts that tour for all different reasons. You know, there, there are artists that have been touring year after year after year that are kind of looking for places they haven't been. KISS is gonna be going out this year and they're gonna be doing some festivals where they'll get big, big money and they'll, they'll go play a festival and, and, you know, maybe now they're in a situation where they would consider playing a smaller market that might route on the way to that big payday. Mm -hmm. Um, where they might not have otherwise. Um, you know, Elton John, I mentioned, is, is an artist that, you know, Elton still works, and he's, he's been having enormous success playing markets that he's never been for, for years. I mean, he's, he's playing places like Yakima, Washington, and, and Billings, Montana, and places you wouldn't expect to see. The big money markets. But he pulls money out of those markets, wow. you know, and it's a big, big deal when he plays those markets, and they've been very smart about it, and they've been, they've been very successful. Do you think we're going to see more... I don't want to use the word heritage acts for some of these guys, but are we going to see further penetration in some of the, you know, Tulsa's? Are we going to see more big names getting into these, these second tier markets? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I do think so. Um, starting to see more of that now. I mean, you know, there, there are other acts that have just been out there a lot that are now looking for places they haven't been. Um, even, you know, the Eagles are an enormous act. And, uh, and, and they command a tremendous amount of money, and you know they've they've gone into some markets that you wouldn't expect to see the Eagles in, and some buildings that were smaller buildings, but they were able to price the tickets in a way that they were able to get them to the number that they were looking for. Um, so th there are going to be some of those situations. Yeah. One of the things we don't really think a lot about as a, as members of bands and as artists ourselves is is the fan experience. Um, you s you spoke earlier about how. Uh, how the artist and the venue sort of have had uh, different takes on the fan experience and how that maybe have negatively influenced our situation um, or vice versa. Could you say a few words about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the fan experience has been pretty, pretty bad for the most part. I, I think, you know, you know, I think the core consumer has really been treated badly in the concert business uh, to a large extent. I mean, concert tickets are expensive. There's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, but just the ability for a fan to get a good ticket at face value for a concert that he really wants to see has really become almost impossible. Um, you know, so much because of the ticket scalping and the secondary market. Um, some of the bands have done a really good job of, of uh, you know, creating a culture that really protects their fans. Uh, and they've, they've taken the extra steps, and it's a lot of work, and they've invested money in it, but they've, you know, they've carved out tickets at every show to make sure that the fan club people get treated a special way. and, and uh, and that's great. It's a lot of extra work, but it's, it's uh, you know, you can see some examples of bands that have really done a very good job of, of doing that. But, you know, to a large extent, particularly in, in the summer months when so many bands are touring, um, there's just a lot of shows going on sale. There's a lot of traffic. And, and sometimes taking care of the fans just becomes a lot of extra work that, that people aren't doing. And, uh, you know, I think fans are just, they're kind of burned. Going to a concert is so expensive, it's just not something they can afford to do too often. And what are, some of the, what are some of the remedies that you're throwing around? Obviously, no one has the answer. We're sort of in this together as an industry. Uh, but 
what are some of the, some of the truths you've found or, or ways that you think can sort of reshape the consumer experience? Well, I think starting with lower ticket prices, that's part of it. Uh, I mean, right the, the problem has been that the, 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 the business model is just, it's just flawed. It's, uh, it's, it's a very low margin, very, very high risk business. So everybody has had their hand in the cookie jar for so long that um, everyone starts counting everybody else's money. So the, you know, the, acts, the big acts can drive big guarantees, which of course, guess what? That drives big ticket prices. And then Ticketmaster says, well, wait a minute, you know, you guys are charging $150 a ticket. We should be entitled to charge $25 for a convenience charge. So it goes on and on and on to where you go to the concert and they're serving you a $10 beer. And it's just, a, it's a rotten experience. It's very expensive. And, and you know, the other thing, you, know, you guys are very young, but you know, as, as you get older, you start families, you leave the house a lot less often. It, it takes a lot more to get you out of the house to go see a concert. It's just, that's how the business works. So a lot of these older artists that have been around for a long time that attract an older demo, you know, it has to be something that you want to see. I, I don't want to leave my house to go see a concert if it's something I've already seen three times. And, you know, and if the band that I want to see now really has two original members, you know, you, you kind of you weigh all that and you figure where you want to spend your money. And there's a lot of different places to spend your money. But, you know, it's, it's pretty tough to go to a concert in an arena, buy two tickets, and, and get experience that for less than 100 bucks. So it's an ex expensive evening for a lot of people. How has, uh, how have you seen the industry change in, tech, in, ten, in the past 10 years? Um, how has technology influenced your day-to-day, -day, the, sort of, uh, the sort of work, the sort of value that you can bring to your, uh, to your clients? I mean, uh, from a marketing standpoint, it's, you know, it, it's becoming, there are a lot of new avenues to, to market shows, to get the word out about shows. There's also a lot more clutter to cut through. So that, that's one of the challenges. But, you know, as you mine your databases and build your databases and you can, you know, you can blast things out to audiences on an immediate basis. And if you can get the participation of the artists too, and they're bringing stuff to the table and talking to their fans and bringing their existing fan base, um, that's a huge advantage. I think that's a great advantage. I wish on the, on the other side of technology, I wish you could take a, tr a tour that was like a 23 truck. You know, there are tours out playing arenas that have 22, 23 semis full of gear, wow. which is insane. That, you know, if they could use technology to put on a concert <laughs> so that you could squeeze all that stuff in about six trucks, it would, it would save the promoters and the acts a ton of money. So that's where most of the overhead comes from? It's just the sheer amount of musical gear and uh, the, show gear? Well, I mean, the cost of doing a show I mean, you can take 50, 60 arenas across the country, and, and the cost of doing, the, sing, hands down, the most expensive venue arena in America is going to be Madison Square Gardens. It's, it's a crap hole, it's an old place, but it's a prestigious play, and you want to play there, and it's a very, very expensive place. Um, Boston's expensive, Philly, some of the northeastern cities, but Madison Square Gardens is just off the charts. I know that when we do a show, and it's the same show, and it, with the last Neil Diamond tour we had, I think, 13 semis. And, you know, it's the same show, and the schedule's pretty much the same. You load in at the same time, you do sound check at the same time, you do the show, the out takes about the same length of time. There's a few learning curves early in the tour when you don't know how long it takes to pack the trucks, and then they, they figure all that stuff out. But after a while, it's pretty much a machine, and, and every show day is pretty much the same. But it, at the end of a tour, I can look to see that there's stagehand bills for the exact same production that are, you know, $12,000 in one place and $60,000 in another place, and it's because of unions and... and, and and uh, you know labor groups and that kind of stuff. So uh, all these expenses kind of uh, you know kind of expand, and and so there are expenses on both sides of the equation. If if you're on the artist side and you're traveling, you've got all these people on the road. You've got your trucks, your buses, your personnel, your hotels, your per diems, your sound, your lights, all that stuff. And as an artist, you're getting paid so much to perform, so you've got to cover all that overhead. That's your your musicians, your crew, all those people. On the promoter side. Promoter's the, promoter's the guy that's buying the act, so he's putting up the money to bring the artist here. So the artist is responsible for those expenses, but the promoter is now responsible for paying, you know, the rental, the hall rental, the advertising, the marketing, the stage ends, the ushers, the ticket takers, the catering backstage, all those expenses. And when you take all those expenses plus the cost of the talent, uh, you know, your exposure is very, very high. You're hoping to sell enough tickets to pay for all that stuff wow. and end up going home with money in your pocket. And, you know, sometimes you're right and sometimes you're not right. And, and you know, they can be very, very expensive, expensive lessons. So it has nothing to do with technology. It's just how the, how the expense is related to a show work. Right. How, uh, now, settlement, something you've, you've done on many occasions. Um, could you explain 
what that is in the parties involved. I know that it's uh, someone representing the artist, someone representing the promoter, someone even representing, um, well, the, it's very different types. Could you say a few words about it? Sure. I mean, so it's, it's the night of a show, and the band's on stage playing, and now it's time to settle the show. So this, the settlement, show settlement is the financial settlement. Um, and there's a few different settlements that go on. So first, you need to sit down with the box office manager and find out how many tickets were sold, and you need to verify all that to make sure that that's right. And you go through all that. How many tickets were sold at this price? How many tickets were sold at this price? How many comps? Those are too many comps. How come there's too many comps? You go through, you know, you, you, you verify all, all the revenue numbers. Um, then you need to sit down and look at the expenses. So you need to look at the venue settlement. The venue is going to show you all their expenses, which would be typically the stagehands and the ushers and the ticket takers, the hall rental, that. Then there's all the other promoter types of expenses, which would be music license fees for ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, maybe insurance, uh, maybe runners, because the runners had to go get grocery store. They had, they had to buy shaving cream for this guy or whatever. All these expenses need to land on a piece of paper so you can then sit down as the promoter and settle the show with the artist representative, which is typically the tour accountant. He's the guy that's responsible for collecting the artist money. And the way the artist deals typically work is that they get a guarantee of X amount versus or plus a percentage. So they're guaranteed a certain amount, but based on how well the show did, if the show did really well, they'll walk out with extra money. So they take an active interest in all the show expenses because on a, let's just say, for example, an artist is being paid $100,000 versus 90% of the net. What that means is after all the expenses, if 90% is greater than the 100000 that's what they're walking out with. So they want to look at all the expenses and verify it. So settlement is when you sit down and you go through all this. So there's, there's lots of bills to collect during the night um, that need to be approved. They need to land on the settlement sheet. And you've got to have the promoter and the artist representative, the, the tour accountant, agree on the numbers. And then that's how the artist gets the balance of their money. They've usually been paid a deposit of some kind before the show. Um, so that's what takes place in a settlement. As we, uh, well, as we sit here, we have a lot of students who, who love putting on concerts. They're, they're maybe thinking about going into starting their own promo company. Some of ours even have them. You know, they don't have venues, but they know a lot of great bands. They know they have some, some pretty good contacts within venues. What are some of the things they should be thinking about? What's some advice you can get from, from them? I think if you're producing a lot of young artist, kind of be looking, at this stage, be looking at it from, from everyone's perspective. You know, as you're booking bands and clubs trying to be a promoter, pay attention to the acts, because you may see an act that you decide that you want to try managing. That might be a totally different direction, but you might stumble into that. So don't be, don't be so narrowly focused that I only want to promote shows, because it, it might open up some other avenues. Um, you know, give a lot of thought to how you market the shows, how you get the word out. And, and how you can collect a database of people that are coming to your shows. Try and you know, think about what you can do to make your show special, to make your show stand out. Um, see if you can find that, that little hook. And, uh, you know, and really work on your relationship with the venue operator. Because you know, the shows that you're promoting are basically generating revenue, hopefully, for the venue operator. And if you're doing a good job and you're bringing people through the doors, um, I think that, you know, particularly if you can create a database of people who are coming to your shows, that's something that hopefully you can take to another place and maybe build on that relationship a little bit more where you're able to, you know, ultimately what you want to do is you want to be able to participate in other revenue streams. So if you're doing a good job and you're bringing people through the doors, that's the time to go to your club owner and say, hey, you know, we've done the last six shows, they've been really successful. You know, I really need a dollar from this. And maybe he'll tell you to take a hike, maybe he'll give it to you. Or maybe if you've got a database, you're in a better position to go to another club or another venue and say, I got this database with 2,000 people. I can start booking stuff here, but I need that dollar. And, and maybe he'll be the guy that says yes. When you say dollar, you mean s such as from the beer, from? Somewhere, yeah. OK. Yeah. So there's other, there, you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to build up uh, experience to sort of expand in the revenue, like you said. Exactly. I mean, the, you know, it, it's always good to have an awareness of, of how everybody in the food chain makes money. The venue makes money from those ancillary revenues, from the beer, the popcorn, maybe a, a piece of merchandise sales. Um, if it's a larger venue with like a Ticketmaster type contract or some kind of a, a computerized ticketing, they're getting, they're getting rebates from that too. That's a really important revenue stream. So um, 
you know, if you're bringing shows to their venue, you're the only guy at risk. They can only make money. I'm not saying that you're on, uh, you're on a footing to negotiate that kind of deal from day one, but you know, maybe you are at some point in time to where you're able to get just a little sliver of something from the inside that kind of helps cover your risk. Because if you don't do well, you're the one that loses money. And, right, and it's, the, your, it's your risk. Right. So uh, you said mining your own database. That's, that's the only thing that you can really own from putting on events. That's, that's a very critical part of what we do as, as event promoters. I think so. If you, if you don't own a venue, I think having your own database is, is really, really important. Um, you know, you can, you know, this is the tricky thing with the clubs because we've had some of these conversations today with, with, with some of the students that are promoting shows in clubs and, you know, they're, they're with local acts that don't, in other words, there's not a reason or a compelling reason to buy an advance ticket to see a local act in a, in a, in a local bar. Um, so, yeah, other than the database, I would say if you had your own little ticketing company or you can use your own little ticketing company so that some of that money was trickling back to you. But I don't, I don't think that's as relevant for, for the kinds of shows that, that are being done in the clubs. So, uh, as we, but, you're not just, you're, but you're not just an event promoter and event coordinator. Um, you also do a lot of what's called uh, venue consulting. Uh, could, you, could you maybe say a few words about... Uh, Let's say you're working with a, a theater that holds 1,500 people. You know, what, are, what are some of the things that venues are concerned about? What are some of the angles that, that they're interested in talking about? And especially for, for us, as, uh, as some of us have, have bands and have artists that we'd like to work with venues, um, what's the language we need to know? Um, I mean, on the, you know, theaters seem to fall in a couple different categories. There's, there's theaters that are more along the... Um, type of a performing arts center that will, you know, those types of theaters are usually doing, they'll have some kind of a Broadway series, they'll have, you know, cultural events, they'll have maybe family and children shows. They may occasionally do a rock show, but it's a real, it's a real safe kind of a rock show. It's the Moody Blues or it's, right. you know, REO Speedwagon or something like that. Then there, then there are other theaters that are, that are more active rock houses. Um, and I think those guys are really just looking for, for niche programming. They're looking you know, in every community, there's 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 typically more than one theater. There's there's you know a number of clubs. There there might be an arena or whatever. So you kind of have to look around and figure out uh, if you can find a niche that's not being serviced, or if you can find something you think you can do better than another guy, then maybe those are the kinds of acts that that you want to go after. But if you're responsible for programming a theater, you want to be able to do a little bit of everything. I mean, it, you know, you can't just rely on the rock stuff. If you're booking a House of Blues, that's a different deal. Mm -hmm. Then you're just then you're just booking the rock stuff. Uh, one of the things that you do now is you're not just. <coughs> excuse me. You you started your own group, um, African group. What was your transition like from working for someone else to working from to working for yourself? What's some of the stuff that you thought about? Uh, pros and cons of that decision. Things you wish you could do differently. Um, you know, I always wanted to have my own business, and uh, and when I finally did it, I really did it, you know, largely without a safety net, and really without a plan, you know. And it's you know. But you started it. You were like, I'm gonna, I need to get out there. I started it, and you know, it's kind of funny because I had experience being in, in a larger business where I was, you know, responsible for running departments and had employees and operations and a lot, uh, you know, and you know, had a lot of financial responsibility. And yet, when it came to my own thing, I was blindly naive. Um, it turned out okay, but it, it took a while to get traction. Um, it, it took a couple years of just kind of, you know, feeling like a cork kind of bobbing in the ocean, waiting for a current to take me one direction or another direction. Um, I, I had some projects right away, but they were very small projects. And, and in the very beginning, I was taking on, uh, I was taking on some very small stuff just to have something to do. You're saying yes to everything. Yeah, when the opportunity came up. I mean, you know, uh, you know one of the things I, I, I have definitely learned over the years is, particularly with a business that is a project-driven business, we work on stuff all the time that has a start, a middle, and an ending. And even a tour, as big as, as it is, when it's over, it's over. I mean, it's, you know, you work on something for months and months and months and months. And, and literally from the time, like on a Neil Diamond, uh, on a year where I'm working on, an, on a world tour, that is a 20-month window from the time that we sit down and start planning the tour to the day we play off the last show. And it's an incredible amount of work. And, when, and you can feel it as it's winding down. It's kind of like, I don't have as many people to call today. I don't have as much to do. And then when it's over, it's like, I'm done. 
And it's a great feeling, but you know, that's followed by that immediate panic like, oh my God, I gotta find the next big project. So thankfully now our business has a lot of continuity because we have a lot of ongoing consulting clients. But you know, on the project side, one of the lessons I've definitely learned is that it's always good to be active. And, and if that, you know, some years that means we're doing big, big projects, and some years that means we're not doing such big stuff. But, but just, just by staying in the game and staying active, I mean, there, I can think of periods of time where, you know, we spent months working on a couple of projects that were teensy little projects, but we did it, and we did a great job, and we overdid it because we had all this time on our hands. And then a big, a big client just fell out of the sky. We started doing stuff for Motorola, and it, it, it came in a time where, you know, we'd finished a big tour, we didn't have that much going on, you know, then all of a sudden we started doing things, for, shows for Motorola. Motorola was flying their clients all over the world to do these big, extravagant things, uh, events. And uh, so it's it, always important to be active, even if you're doing something small. Because eventually something will happen. You just got to stay in the game, kind of keep doing it. Um, you work with not just artists, not, with, not just managers, but with large companies like Motorola. I mean, uh, what do you think is a skill set to be able to work with, with various types of people. You know, artists think, I'm maybe making a generalization, I don't think artists think anything like people who run Motorola. You know, it may not, may not, may not be the case. But clearly, you have, um, you have a skill of being able to relate all these different facets to each other. Um, some artists would surprise you. <laughs> There's some artists that are so in tune with their business, it, it's, it's really impressive. Um, no, I think just I think just attention to detail and, and just be straight with people and, and don't don't overpromise, you know. And, and you know, regardless of you know, in our case, I mean, we do have situations where our client is an artist. I mean, and other situations where it is a corporation. And, and you think that they're very different people, but if you approach it from the standpoint of trying to understand what their objectives are and what they're trying to accomplish, then we can put together a plan and you know, hopefully meet and, and exceed those goals. So it's really just it's. In any form of business, you have to understand what the objectives are. You know, if I'm just trying to sit down with you and convince you to do something that isn't even in line with what you want to do. Now, where it's tough is when you sit down and you do a meeting with someone that tells you what they want to do, and they have absolutely no idea what they want to do. Yeah. And then you meet with them again, and you hear them go 180 degrees. Those are, those are challenging meetings. You know, and, and there's a very good likelihood that you're going to have a very unhappy client because they don't really know what they want. But they're, they're all very clear on what they don't want. But you usually find out about those when it's too late. Uh, we're going to open the floor up for questions, but I wanted to ask, in five years, where do you see the concert industry? What are some of the trends you think are starting to pick up? What are some of the changes you're starting to hear or you're starting to think are happening? Yeah, really good question. I mean, uh, uh, the concert business, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't know how similar the concert business is to other industries, but I, I know the concert business in its infancy was made up of old school concert promoters, guys that you guys have probably heard of, like Bill Graham or maybe Larry Maggot. I mean, every major city, every major, major territory had a guy. He was like, the, he was like the, the, the godfather of that business in that territory. And that was kind of how that business ran. And then, you know, SFX came along and bought up all these old school concert promoters and, and consolidated that business. And it became Clear Channel, and then it became Live Nation. Um, so there's this tremendous consolidation of all these guys that were fiercely independent. So, you know, you've, right now you've got a business where there's two large, large promoters, Live Nation and AEG. And there's still some independents out there, but where I think it's going is, I, I actually think that there will become more and more independent promoters over the next five years. And I think it's, it's really starting to happen now. And there are different reasons for that. I mean, Live Nation has bought up all these old school guys that they can't afford to keep on the payroll. They're gonna get bounced out. They're, you know, they're thinning their overhead, so there's more guys that are going to get bounced out. And then there's a lot of new young people that are just kind of coming through the ranks that are promoting shows on their own, learning how to do it because they couldn't get a job somewhere else and they figured it out. And I think that, um, I think there'll be a lot more, I think the independent promoter scene will be a lot healthier. And I also think there's going to be a lot of acts that don't necessarily want to just get a paycheck from a big company. Really? Um, I think there will be, and I think that they'll, they'll, there will be artists that have a very specific idea on how they want to be promoted, and that they don't want to just work with one promoter or another, that they want to work with a lot of different promoters. You know, the reason for independent promoters was that that guy was a guy that knew the market, he knew the radio station, he knew how to market shows in his town. And um, I have a feeling that, it, that this national uh, talent buying or national promoting is going to 
it's still going to exist for certain acts, but it's really going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I think the independent concert scene is going to be thriving again. Right on. Do we have any questions, Jeff? Anyone out there? You said the uh, planning. <clears throat> you said the planning process for a uh, or the whole uh, concert was about twenty months or so. I'm wondering how many months out before like the first show date is, is the is the norm. Like when when you start when you first start planning the tour. Now I'm talking about one particular artist. Now I, I, the flip side is, I, I get calls from agents about shows that are five weeks from today that they need to book today. I, I've seen it both wow. ends of the spectrum. For us, you know, part of part of our process is putting together tours and looking at them and kind of figuring out what we don't like about them. That takes a lot of extra time, and and uh, it also takes a lot a lot of work getting to a point where the artist says yes, this is what I want to do. So in those instances, I mean, I've routed tours that, that we weren't playing a date off for you know, 11 months. Um, that, that's probably really unusual, I would think. But I have had that experience. Another question? Angel. One thing um, that is severely underplayed in this major that we haven't really learned about, that we should learn about, uh, is the politics behind music. And how it's so political and it gets it's nasty sometimes, especially in promoting, independent promoting. Could you say something about, on the big level, how these guys form political relationships with agents and, and you know, the game they play between each other? It's because it gets nasty sometimes. Uh, it does get nasty sometimes. I mean, it, it almost always involves money. Um, you know, the uh, artists that have been around for a long time know a lot of people, and they've, they've had experiences where they've, they've been burned by a lot of people. So by nature, a lot of artists are not necessarily trusting guys because they have been treated badly at, at one point in time or another. Um, I mean, every artist has a team, and, and you know, at, at the core of the team is the artist, but the, the members of the team are the manager, the agent, uh, there's always a lawyer, there's a business manager. Um, you know, and they, you know, the artist probably has their own office, their own backroom operation, and then that doesn't even count all the touring personnel. So every situation is different. I mean, uh, there are a number of artists that have been with managers for years, and, and you know, those managers kind of drive a lot of those relationships. Um, but you know, the biggest contentions I've seen in recent years all involve money. And I mean, I've seen tour deals, for example, go with an artist where, where one company is saying there's absolutely no way that we're going to spend more than $350,000 a night for this artist. And this isn't just $350,000 a night. This is $350,000 a night, and we're guaranteeing you 40 nights. And before you know it, two days later, the same guy that said that has bought the tour for $425,000. And it's, you know, there's, I saw it happen recently with the, uh, no, I, you know, I don't want to name names, but I, 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 there are a lot of voices in these people's ears. And, you know, it's not always politics. I guess maybe I would characterize it more as relationships. Um, you know, there are definitely people that have things to prove, and there are definitely people that have more leverage than other people, and they definitely are smart people who know how to utilize leverage. I mean, a manager that manages this act uh, that's dealing with a promoter can definitely say, look, take care of me here because... I've got this other act, and he needs to come down and tour Australia. He could work with you or some other promoter. So do you want to take care of me today so I'll remember you tomorrow? I mean, that kind of stuff goes on all the time. Um, I don't know if I'm giving you a good answer, but it's, it's case by case, and it's just I think relationships are really important. Any questions? Uh, just with, like, the sheer number of venues that there are in a lot of different cities, I was wondering, like, what gives uh, venues, like, a competitive advantage? What brings... A brings people in, like what do people want out of a venue and what do you, artists look for in a venue, you know, in terms of what what stands out, what makes it different than just uh, like a, a standard industry standard venue or something that's unique? Well, I, I have a few theories on that. I mean, uh, on one hand, new venues, new arenas, when there's a new arena that's built in the city, uh, typically enjoy kind of a honeymoon period. You know, we were talking about Tulsa a minute ago, but Tulsa has a, a, an arena that's, you know, less than two years old, and they're really enjoying a great honeymoon. They've played everybody in, this, in Tulsa, right? Um, so I think buildings can enjoy that. Usually it has to do with venue capacity, um, you know, and what's the right size venue for the act. Uh, you know, acts do not want to be embarrassed. They don't want to be in situations where they're looking at a bunch of empty seats. 
And you know, for that reason, a lot of the, a lot of the major market arenas uh, were uh, brought in, you know, have, have invested in draping systems where they can, they can make the, the, the arena a little more intimate. They can cut it in half or sometimes they can, they can drape the entire upper concourse to give them flexibility to do different configurations. That, you know, they do that because they feel it gives them a competitive environment, but usually that decision is driven by, um, by the venue capacity. The other thing, though, is I have a theory about artists. The artist's memory is really, really good when it comes to something that, that, that goes wrong. I have another theory that an artist only remembers the last eight shows on a tour. So make sure that they're winners. When, you know, when you, when you come to the finish line, make sure you're going with your strong, you some really strong dates. But uh, honestly, I've dealt with artists that they won't go to a city because they remember how awful the hotel was. Has nothing to do with, has no, you know, the fire alarm went off in the hotel. I was standing outside my bathrobe. We're not going there again. <coughs> oh, okay. I mean, that kind of stuff has happened. But, but usually venue selection has to do with the size of the venue, typically. Uh, I don't know how long it's been since you've had to deal with this type of situation, but if you're with an artist that's opening a big tour and you might not be making enough money on the tour, you know, you come back losing money, but it's a really big opportunity. Do you think that's more worth it than doing your own tour where you could bring back a little money playing smaller shows at, you know, stuff you book on your own versus like the, the pros and cons of like that situation? Uh, really good question. Um, I have an artist that I manage that, uh, opened last year for Jeff Beck in seven cities. And it was exactly that situation. And uh, it was a little bit of a different situation because we, you know, my artist is kind of a guitar shredder and they, they wanted him to do a little something different just to provide kind of a contrast with what Jeff was doing. But it was an enormously important opportunity for us. Uh, so we took it. And we were actually being considered for an opening slot on a, on a big classic rock summer tour. And I already know the money will be lousy, but I'm, I'm chasing it hard to try and get it because it'll just be an opportunity to get in front of more people. You know, the question is, if you get that opportunity, what do you do with the opportunity? How do you leverage that into more people visiting your website, more people listening to your stuff, more people buying your, your, your merchandise or whatever? So I, I think if you're fortunate enough to do that, you know, if you're playing a club, you know, you're hoping that 100 people are gonna walk through the door. But, you know, if you're supporting a larger situation, you get in front of three to four, 5,000 people a night, it's just, it's just too important not to do it. Even if you lose money, you've got to figure out how to do it. Right Any questions? Well, Jeff, thank you so much for your time. Great. I appreciate having you Thanks, on. Guys. Thank, thank you. you so much.